Hi, everyone. Um, I wish I could see your faces. This is a little bit strange, but I'm delighted to be here and delighted to have this opportunity to share some of our work uh, on this very important topic. So my goal for today is to give you just 10 minutes or so of an overview and then open it up to Q&A and discussion for about 20 minutes. So I, I hope that sounds good. And uh, let me go ahead then and share my screen. Okay. All right, uh, so let me start uh, with this. So in 1966, Martin Luther King Jr. addressed the Medical Committee for Human Rights, and he famously stated that of all the forms of inequality, injustice and in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And I think shocking and inhumane because healthcare can make the difference between life and death, but also because the stated purpose of healthcare is to reduce pain and suffering. And so to condone healthcare inequalities is to condone the pain and suffering of black and brown people. And the fact is that racial disparities in the US are big uh, and they're, they've persisted. And this is obviously something we've seen in the current COVID crisis. Uh, in the most recent report, the US Department of Health and Human Services finds that blacks and Hispanics in this country receive worse care than whites for about 40% of quality measures. And quality measures include the receipt of specific services to treat or prevent medical conditions, as well as the outcomes of those treatments, uh, outcomes that include mortality. So this is really consequential. Um, and these healthcare disparities, uh, I think, are really striking in the pain management space. Uh, we know from research, and this is an excellent review, uh, that Black patients are less likely to receive pain meds when they're in pain. And if they do receive pain meds, they receive less of them. So just to give you a sense of what that scope looks like, uh, here's one study looking at long bone fractures. Uh, in this study, they find that whites receive uh, pain meds 74% of the time, and that's significantly more than black patients who receive uh, pain meds 57% of the time. Another study uh, looking at bone fractures, again, finds here that whites on average get significantly more pain meds uh, than blacks and Hispanic patients. And this is not specific to bone fractures. Uh, in fact, we see it in cancer pain as well. And cancer here is a really important and notable context because the World Health Organization has established clear guidelines about how to treat cancer pain. And so here, Cleveland and colleagues argue that it's not just that whites get treated uh, more, that they receive more pain meds or are more likely to receive them, is that black patients, minority patients more generally, are undertreated for pain. And that's really important in light of the current opioid crisis and concerns over um, over treatment and over prescription. And so in our view, very, very broadly speaking, uh, we see two possibilities for how these kinds of healthcare disparities in pain management might arise. The first is that perhaps black patients' pain is recognized, but it's not treated. Uh, and along those lines, researchers have proposed, and there is some support, uh, that medical personnel have stereotypes, uh, that they make stereotypic assumptions about their black patients. They assume that black patients can't afford pain meds or that they will sell their meds or that they will abuse their meds and that could lead uh, to, to under treatment. Another possibility that we've explored that others have explored as well is that perhaps black patients pain is not recognized in the first place uh, and therefore can't be treated. And there's increasingly uh, evidence uh, for, for this possibility, studies from our lab, from others' labs, uh, showing that people a priori think that black people feel less pain than white people. There's also increasingly evidence that this is true of physicians. So let me just share with you some of that data. This is uh, a seminal st study by Lisa Staten and her colleagues. Uh, I, just, I, love, I love it for its scope and simplicity. Uh, here, researchers surveyed patients and their physicians at 12 primary care centers. They asked patients to report their pain intensity on a zero to 10 scale. If you've been to the emergency room, you know the scale. It's the no pain at all to unbearable pain, the smiley face to frowny face uh, scale. And they also asked physicians to rate the pain of their patients on that same scale. And what they found is that physicians reliably underestimated their patients' pain 39% of the time and were significantly more likely to do that for their black patients relative to their white patients. In fact, physicians underestimated the pain of their black patients 50% of the time. In another study, uh, some of my colleagues and I looked at uh, perceptions of pain among NCAA medical staff. So here's what we did. Uh, we recruited uh, 651 
uh, people who were in the medical staff NCAA Division I sports teams. They read a case about a student athlete who had torn an ACL. And then they answered questions about the case, specifically, how painful do you think this was for this athlete? They also answered questions about their racial attitudes, so the extent to which they agreed or disagreed with statements like, Irish, Italians, Jews, and many other minorities overcame prejudice and worked their way up, and others should do the, and Blacks should do the same without any special favors. I can't see part of my screen because of the, of the video. Um, this is what actually the, this is what the vignette, the, the case looked like. Uh, the way that we randomly assigned our participants to either consider a black student athlete or a white student athlete is to manipulate the name of the student athlete. So we used either stereotypically black names or stereotypically white names. We also varied uh, the sport context and that's less important for today's talk in conversation. Uh, but what we found is that participants gave lower pain ratings uh, in the black student athlete condition relative to the white student athlete condition. In other words, they, they thought the black athlete, uh, student athlete would feel less pain. And importantly, our racial attitude measure did not predict whether uh, participants showed this bias or not. And what that means then is that even participants, and this has been true in other studies, even participants who have very positive racial attitudes show this bias. They think that black people feel less pain than white people. And so just for the rest of my talk today, I wanna to share with you just a little bit more data, uh, looking at two, I think, really important follow-up questions. The first is, if racial attitudes don't predict this bias, what does? And here we're looking at beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites. We also wanted to think about downstream consequences of this bias, and so here we'll look at pain treatment recommendations to really speak to the healthcare context. And so just let me say just a little bit about this idea of race and biology and biological differences, uh, because the belief that race is biological, that there are these innate fundamental differences between black people and white people um, is a really old idea. Uh, it has a long history and it's, it's a racist history. So in the 19th century, uh, physicians and scientists used Mason theories of evolution to claim that the Negro was an ancestral race closer to apes and that natural selection had eventually produced the more advanced European. And these claims then were taken by physicians and scientists uh, who then went to catalog biological differences. And then these differences were championed uh, by these folks and by slave owners uh, to justify slavery and the exploitation and violence against slaves. So let me just give you some examples of what these beliefs look like. Uh, this is one example from The Biology of the Negro by Julian Herman Lewis. Uh, you can still find this book, you can buy it online. It's a classic reprint. Uh, here, um, Lewis writes, uh, they, black people, are stoic in their reaction to pain and discomfiture. They do not easily go into shock, take anesthesia well, resist infection, and show remarkable powers of recovery. I should also mention that these kinds of beliefs resurface with some frequency. Uh, there have been a number of pseudoscientific claims uh, that rapid natural selection and selective breeding during slavery uh, can explain the physical prowess of Black people and Black athletes in particular. I think nowadays we often see it more in the athletic space. Uh, so here's just one example, two examples uh, from more recent um, examples of this. And so what we do in this study is we consider that historical context. We consider these narratives about the Black body and pain um, or lack thereof, uh, and we make this prediction. So we predict that beliefs about biological differences will predict racial bias and pain perception, and in turn, that, that will predict uh, pain treatment. So we've done a few studies uh, on this topic. Here I'll show you the one that I think is uh, most central to this work. Uh, this is a study where we recruited first, second, third, and third year medical students and residents. We showed these uh, students two medical cases, one about a black patient, another about a white patient, either suffering from kidney stones or a bone fracture. We asked these participants to rate the amount of pain this patient would feel uh, in this case and to recommend treatment. We also ask students about their biological um, differences beliefs. So let me show you what that looks like concretely. So this was actually one of the cases we used in the study. It's uh, formatted in a very similar way to what medical students would see in medical school. It gives you uh, a patient's name uh, with their history, a review of systems in the physical examination, 
And here we again, we uh, relied on just the, on stereotypically black and white names to manipulate the race of the patient. Uh, we also included the race of the patient uh, in the physical examination notes. So here you're seeing a healthy African American female case uh, studied in another condition that read a healthy African uh, European American female. For treatment recommendations, uh, participants reported a really wide range of potential treatments. Um, treatment recommendations, and we categorized those as accurate or inaccurate, and we did that based on the ratings of 10 experienced physicians. So we asked 10 experienced physicians to read this case uh, without any information on race and gender, and then we asked them to recommend uh, the appropriate treatment, and overwhelmingly the consensus was that both the bone fracture uh, and the kidney stone would require narcotics. So it would be inaccurate if a participant had said that what this patient needs is an ice pack, uh, or Tylenol, for example. These are the kinds of beliefs we measured in the study. So we uh, gave participants uh, a list of, um, of statements about biological differences between blacks and whites, and we asked them the extent to which they thought these statements were definitely untrue to definitely true. Um, I want to point out that I understand that possibly untrue and possibly true are semantically the same thing. Uh, but psychologically, they're not, right? So psychologically, when you go from definitely untrue to definitely true, and even when you make that jump from possibly untrue to possibly true, there's something meaningful uh, in, that, uh, in that linear scale that, that we capture here. So the beliefs we asked about, um, let me just read you some of them, are things like Blacks age more slowly than whites. Blacks nerve endings are less sensitive than whites. Black people's blood coagulates more quickly than whites. Black skin is thicker than whites. And here what I'm showing you now are the percentage of students and residents uh, who said that these statements were possibly, probably, or definitely true. And there are a lot of things to notice uh, about these percentages. The first is that uh, almost none of them are zero, right? And these are, are not, these are false statements. These are, are not biological differences uh, between blacks and whites. So uh, they're not zero with some exceptions. Um, the other thing that is perhaps more heartening is that as you go from first year to residence, they do seem to go down across time. So I just I wanted to make sure that I, I point that out. Now how those beliefs translate or are associated with pain uh, is, is then quite interesting. So here I'll show you a graph of the data on the x-axis. Uh, we've plotted the endorsement of biological beliefs with uh, those who don't endorse them very much, so low beliefs, or those who do endorse them at high rates, high beliefs. And then on the y-axis, I have plotted uh, average pain ratings. And what you find for those who don't endorse these beliefs, who say, no, these are not true beliefs, right? These differences are, are not real, uh, is you see actually the reverse of what we often find, which is here we have participants who are saying the black patient would feel more pain than the white patient. And you know, we're not totally sure what to make of this, but one possibility is that they're reporting on something that they've observed in the world. Uh, we know from some research that, in fact, black patients um, do report more pain relative to white patients, uh, and that could be for lots of reasons. Uh, but that, that could be actually something that, you know, they observed in the world, and so here they're, they're reporting that. But for those who have these beliefs that biological differences are real, uh, we see the predicted bias where these participants are saying or are reporting that white patients would feel more pain than black patients. We see uh, a similar pattern for treatment recommendations, um, although it is a bit different and in, 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 in a way that I think is actually a little bit disturbing or actually I will say a lot disturbing. So let me uh, start with those who don't endorse these beliefs. So when you look at those uh, who do not endorse these biological differences, who say that these are false, uh, what you see is no bias in treatment recommendation. And although I think we often think that no bias is good, in this case, uh, it's worrisome because remember, these are the participants who said that they thought the black patient would feel more pain than the white patient. So the, the no bias here is, is disturbing. Uh, for those who have high beliefs, so those who endorse the beliefs uh, to a greater extent, uh, you see that they would um, treat the white patient uh, with the correct uh, treatment, with the accurate treatment. They would provide narcotics to the white patient more than to the black patient. 
And so I think what we find here and what we have found and others have found um, in other contexts is that people with and without medical training uh, seem to believe that the black body is fundamentally biologically different from the white body. What's interesting about this belief, uh, and this is the work by uh, Williams and Eberhardt, is that these beliefs contemporarily are actually not strongly related uh, to racial prejudice, right? Meaning that even people who who report very positive racial attitudes still think that perhaps the black body is fundamentally biologically different from the white body. What we find in, in these studies, in this study in particular, is that these beliefs are associated with racial bias and pain assessment, and also with pain treatment. And so we think they may be a source of racial disparities in healthcare. I also, I'll just mention this for Q&A uh, purposes uh, and conversation purposes. I, th I think more generally, um, these findings have implications for the current COVID crisis. Uh, I think they have implications for what anti-racist education in medical school, but even outside of medical schools could look like. Um, and I think they, they have something to say about, um, about police violence as well. So we can talk about that in Q&A. I just wanted to plant that seed. And so let me just uh, end where I started. Uh, if we think that healthcare inequalities are shocking and inhumane, uh, we have to work and we have to work harder to understand them and eliminate them. And I think the current work and the work that we're currently doing suggests that perhaps one step forward uh, is to challenge these old and racist notions that the black body is somehow fundamentally and biologically different uh, from the white body. Okay, so let me stop sharing that. Um, okay, and we'll go to Q&A. Oh, let me first check. Okay, no, nothing in the chat. Okay, Q&A. Okay, uh, do you know if any researchers at UVA Hospital are doing anything about this research? Um, you know, that's, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's complicated. Uh, I feel like that's always my answers to my students. Uh, it depends and it's complicated. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, so UVA um, medical school and health system, uh, like many UVA uh, medical schools and health systems, uh, I think do, do a lot around diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, I, I don't have close connections uh, at the med school or the health system. And so I, you know, I, I will tell you what my impression is and with the understanding that I might be missing uh, some things. Uh, but there are, there, there, there is thought being given to training, to how students ought to interact with patients, to be um, fluent multiculturally, to be sensitive to race and other dimensions uh, of identity and inequity. Uh, I think they do a lot around implicit bias training. Um, the issue with this kind of bias though, is that it's just fundamental and it, it can't, you can't undo it in these sort of targeted um, and one-off kinds of programs. Um, students at Brown University at, in the medical school, I love this study so much. Uh, so you had, there are these medical students at Brown, and they went ahead and just gathered all of the slides from their curriculum, from their classes, and they coded every instance uh, that race is mentioned in their classes, and then coded how it was talked about. And what they find is that when race was discussed in their classes, often it was, this, it was used as a biological proxy. Right? And, and so I, I think to really address these kinds of biases, right, you have to fundamentally change how we talk about race, not in a class and not in a unit, but just throughout an entire curriculum. Right? I think every time we talk about race, that would mean then having to talk about racism. Um, and that's gonna be a huge paradigm shift. And so, um, you know, I know they're doing some of that work. There is um, um, someone, I believe, who is creating a curriculum for the residents that is meant to be a critical race theory, anti-racist um, curriculum, and I don't know how far they've gotten, but you know, it's it's going to it's going to require a paradigm shift, and I don't think that um, most universities are quite there. I hope that that answered that. Um, okay, let's see. 
what is your hope in conducting this research? Uh, what would be the best case scenario? Yeah, uh, so that's related, right? Um, the truth is that for us, very clearly, uh, the next step is an intervention. And that's hard for so many reasons. I mean, logistically, it's hard because it's not clear that medical schools are going to be lining up to work with us to reveal a bias and then maybe reduce it. Um, but reducing it is just, it, it's gonna be hard work. And I don't foresee that a quick intervention, the kind of thing that we might just you know, give it a, give a go, um, is going to have a huge impact. Um, getting people to wrap their heads around race as a social construct is just really hard. You know, I, I teach really smart students and they, they know that race is a social construction, but really knowing that, understanding it, requires so much knowledge of our history, of historical harms. Um, and so I, I think it just, again, requires a real paradigm shift in, in how we talk about race um, as it pertains not just to medicine, but to really to our lives. Um, and so I think an intervention is, you know, is where we would like to go. Uh, it would be awesome because I think we, that's clearly the next step. Um, it would also give us some more evidence that this is a causal factor, right? The work that I presented today is correlational. And so we, can, we, we know and we can say that these beliefs are associated with this bias. We haven't shown that they lead to it uh, per se. And, and so I, I think that that intervention work is really important. So you know, I, uh, I am looking for partners. Uh, I've started conversations. Uh, with researchers at other institutions uh, where I think we could really pursue that work. I would love to pursue it here, uh, but you know, that, that's gonna require uh, a lot more conversations and a lot more buy-in. Okay, let's see. What would it look like to work harder to women these racial disparities? Yeah, um, so you know, I mean, I think for me, um, and I think this work has started at many places, is that we need to have conversations, not just about race, but about racism, right? I mean, race, race was constructed, and it was constructed to justify exploitation and violence. Uh, and so having real conversations, not just about race or racism, I, I think is what we have to do um, so that we can understand the structural components of this bias. Because even though, and I'm a social psychologist, I believe that individual attitudes matter. I believe that individual beliefs matter, obviously. But I hope that what this work shows is that these beliefs are bound to a history and that we have to contend with that history if we're going to, to eliminate these biases, right? And so I hope that part of the conversation that this work uh, accomplishes is a more serious, um, consideration of historical harms and how we undo, how we redress those. Um, and so I think the working hard part is really getting people to a place where they understand how these structures and these histories impact us today that we're not beyond our, we haven't moved, you know, we haven't moved beyond our history. We are very much uh, the products of that history. And and that's true even at the individual levels and the beliefs that we hold. So I think the working harder uh, is laying bare the ways in which institutional racism, structural racism is real, making that clear for people so that they can start to really make progress uh, on those. Because the truth is I don't hold a lot of hope uh, for change at the individual level, at least not solely at the individual level. Okay. Uh, We saw that beliefs and differences decline from first year students through residence. However, there seemed to be an increased belief from first to second year, then a decline. Did the study mention this and have any explanation that you're aware? Yeah, that's tough. You know what I mean? The truth is that um, even though our sample size is, is reasonable for our aims, um, it's hard to know whether that was a little hiccup, like if that's just noise or if that's something really meaningful. Um, if it is meaningful, something that happens between the first and second year is that students uh, start to see patients. Um, and so another thing we observed, and I hope, I hope I'm getting this right, I, I think I'm getting this right. So we, I believe we also see an increase in just ratings of pain, right? Just, just across the board, regardless of the patient's race. So I think there is something really um, 
transformational for students as they go from their first to second year, uh, where going from thinking about medicine in sort of very theoretical ways to, to having to interact with patients and see patients and see their pain and see their suffering uh, really changes, I think, how they understand it and see that work. Uh, and so I, I don't know if that's related to that increase uh, and then subsequent decrease with more experience, um, but that is something that changes from first to second year that could create, um, that could create you know, changes um, like those that we see in the data. Okay. What are tangible consequences for Black patients? I mean, the consequences, I, I think, uh, these consequences that we document, I think, are, are quite tangible, right? I mean, the, the fact that these beliefs predict um, seeing Black patients as feeling, experiencing less pain and then prescribing uh, less or, or being less likely to, to actually treat them uh, appropriately, I think that's very, very concrete. And it's actually, it's one of the things I really love about this, this paper um, and then this work is that it makes really concrete the ways in which beliefs that are grounded in our history um, can, can be tied to current and very concrete disparities. And so I, I see the consequences that we, um, that we see as very tangible. I, I think what is frustrating for us as a research team, and I imagine it's frustrating for people who consume this research and particularly um, African-Americans who know of this research, is that we don't offer in this work anything concrete about how to make that better, either for individual patients, right, or, um, or for their healthcare field. Um, I think that's the work we have to do, it's the work we have to do next, and we just haven't done it. I mean, I, we get occasionally emails um, from black patients who say, my doctor doesn't believe me that I'm in pain. Could you please tell them about your work? And at the end of the day, what we document in this work are tr things that are true on average, uh, and it gets really complicated to apply them to individuals. Um, and so I, I, I worry that just knowing that this is a bias can actually create a lot of distress uh, for people without providing any real, you know, tangible thing that people can do to try to avoid it in their own lives. Um, but we are, we're, we are working on it. I mean, the idea that we have to make clear how race was constructed um, and to start to deconstruct racism, like that, that's the work we want to do and that's the work we're, we're pushing forward with, but we, we still have some, some ways to go. I've been thinking a lot about this in relation to the case of Elijah McLean and George Floyd. Yeah, I have too. Uh, this research, I think, should extend to first responders and police. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, I think this work in conjunction with other work uh, tells something that, we, that feels compelling to me. Um, we know from other work that Black people, even Black children, are perceived as physically threatening. We know they're perceived as physically formidable. Um, and in this work, we see that they're perceived as feeling less pain. I think if you put all of those research findings together, what you end up with is this narrative uh, that Black people are, are harder to control. Um, and for those who seek to have control and to maintain control then, uh, I think this narrative that Black people are difficult to control um, can absolutely play into um, these situations where then violence and, and use of force seems warranted. Uh, and so I totally agree. I, I think this should extend to first responders and police. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know that that work is being done. Um, but I agree, I think that's really important work. Uh, and it, it makes sense to me that there are those connections. Okay, what would it take to eliminate this bias? Uh, man, I wish I knew. Uh, do we have any evidence of what is most effective and what type of training, what type of accountability? You know, I, it's just, it is, it is so frustrating that I can't answer that question. And I understand that that must be frustrating for y'all as well. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think it is just, we've thought a lot about how do you teach medical students, how do you teach people, right, because medical students are not alone in this, 
that race is not true, right? That race is not biological, that we've made it real because of racism, but it's not true. There's nothing fundamentally sort of innately different. Um, and given our historical context, given our social cultural context, I just don't see how any one-off training could do that kind of work. Uh, I think we really need a paradigm shift. If you think about this bias, um, and, I, and I've started to think about this bias in this way, as being really fundamental to empathy and compassion, right? If you can't recognize someone's pain and suffering, right, then there is no hope for empathy and compassion. Um, if we can't understand and see people's uh, pain and suffering, then there's no hope for reconciliation and repair. Um, and so we have to get there, right? We have to see the shared humanity of people. Um, and I, I don't know how to, I, I, don't, I don't know what does that. Uh, you know, I mean, I think social psychology has some answers that um, are sometimes helpful, but feel very small and ultimately unsatisfying, right? So we know, for example, that intergroup contact um, is really good at improving attitudes, uh, but that's just, that's, that's not enough. I mean, we really need a paradigm shift, right? We need, we need a new way of thinking so that we can see and recognize the humanity, our shared humanity in all people. Um, and so I really, I wish I knew. Uh, oh, I had another thought. Another thought, um, we did have, um, students of color in our sample. And those data are complicated. Uh, we've, um, we've published them online elsewhere and, and separately. Uh, but here's what we find with those students. So, and, we, and I should say also, we just, we don't have enough black students uh, to look at them separately. So here we're looking at students of color. And what we find in those data is that uh, they also endorse um, biological beliefs about race to some extent. Um, but in that case, it doesn't predict um, it doesn't predict racial bias and pain perception or treatment. And I find that actually sort of uh, hopeful in some way, um, because what that says to me is that while we do the hard work of deconstructing racism and making it clear how race uh, was created uh, to support systems uh, of oppression. There are other things that one might do to not exhibit these biases that have real consequences for people. Um, now, I don't know what I don't know what the moderator is. I don't know what it was about those students that cut the link between these beliefs and these outcomes. Um, and I wish we did. Anecdotally, I can tell you that students of color um, care more about racial disparities. Uh, than do white students. Uh, and so there might be a motivated sort of component to this, right? That you might have these beliefs, but you might also have these motivations and they might actually um, undermine the extent to which these beliefs can have impact. Um, but we, yeah, I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer for this. I wish I did. How do we have impactful conversations when often some individuals are combative to these conversations and do not seek to learn or empathize, but instead qualify or argue against lived experience that are not their own? Um, oh man, these are so hard, uh, but it's such a good question. You know, I, I, am, I want to be tentatively, tentatively optimistic about this moment. Um, you know, I, one of my students, um, emailed me to tell me that she wanted to buy the book White Fragility, but it was sold out on Amazon. And I thought, hmm, okay, like that's, that's cool. Uh, and so I'm, I, I am hoping that this is a time of real um, change, but I've thought that before, right? I mean, I have thought that we are on the precipice of change for a long time and that we never are. And so, how to have these impactful conversations, um, that's a really, that's a major challenge, right? I mean, it's, I think sometimes we tell the story that, you know, this is all about implicit bias and then I'm biased and you're biased, but we don't mean to be. And it's just, you know, this like weird little bug in our heads and it's just part of our mental architecture. I mean, I think what this work shows and what other work I think shows even better, and I'm thinking of the work of Keith Payne and Kazmin Branyanuzi, where they show that, 
slave population at the county level in 1862 predicts modern day implicit bias at the county level, right? I think that shows us that the biases we carry are not just a function of our mental or brain architecture that we like people who are like us and we don't like people who are not like us. We like our in-groups and we don't like our out-groups. Our attitudes and beliefs are shaped or bound to our history. Um, and I, th I think making that plain and clear, uh, I think, can help, can help start the conversation. You know, ultimately, I think, you know, I think white people have a lot of work to do. And I, I think, you know, I, um, I see it as a real responsibility of mine uh, to try to create space for white students, white friends, white family members, you know, my white son. <laughs> Uh, to have these conversations, and they are really difficult. Um, but I think starting them early matters. You know, I we find in other work that kids as young as seven have this bias. Kids at seven think that black people, white kids at seven, think that black people feel less pain than white people. Um, my son is six; he's about to turn seven. You know, like that's the window, um, and so. So no, I mean, I, you know, talking about these issues, um, it matters and, and we have to understand the historical context. And, you know, the truth is that my discipline has not always been good about doing that, but I think increasingly we are aware of it and are finding ways to really make it concrete for people. You know, so I, I hear you, like these conversations are really hard uh, and a lot of people don't want to have them. And it's in part because these conversations are scary. It's in part because people are invested in having these identities where they think that they're not the problem and they're not prejudiced and they're not racist. Um, and partly because they want to protect their privilege, right? No one wants to think that what they have is not earned. Um, and so it's, it is, it's really hard. Uh, I will say that there's beautiful work by Brian Lowry uh, showing that um, if you frame disparities, I hope I get this right. I'll double check after this. I'll email y'all if it's not, but I think this is a finding. Uh, that if you frame disparities as black disadvantage, uh, the white participants are less likely to support any number of reforms relative to if you frame it as a um, white advantage, right? So, so really shedding light on white privilege for white people is important for getting them to understand what reparations are needed. Um, but I also understand that that, that conversation um, is, is hard and that people get defensive and combative, um, but it's time to have these conversations. Other questions? Okay, let's see. What has been most helpful to you personally in deepening your empathy and empathy and compassion? Um, yeah, that's a really, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, I'm going to psychologize this in a way that, you know, I think feels true to me and, and I actually don't know if this is actually my path, but I, th I think it is. Um, I grew up in a tiny, tiny village of 900 people in Northeastern France. And that, you know, that community was not diverse really in any way. You know, it was 900 people, all white, uh, all Catholic with the exception of one family when I was living there. Um, you know, I think ideologically very similar. Um, and when I was 10 years old, we moved to, to the United States and we moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. And Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, you know, even just in the airport, uh, is diverse in ways I've never experienced. Um, and I, I remember finding that really exciting. And I have this whole roll of film from the airport, right? Just being like, oh, people, people that don't look like me. This is really, this is strange and this is interesting. 
Um, and then, you know, of course, I mean, as a 10 year old, you then observe very quickly that this is sort of not the default, that people are not excited about um, diversity. And at the time in Charlotte Mecklenburg, uh, they were trying to integrate the schools. And so they were busing uh, kids from the suburbs to uh, inner city schools. And that was one of those kids from the suburbs being bused uh, to these inner city schools. And so I actually, I went to uh, a predominantly black middle school. And I think for me, that was really, um, that was probably life changing. You know, and I, again, like I, I can't tell you like how that was the thing and what the moment was. Um, but the, I think that that had to leave an impression on me. Um, the other thing I, I think, and I credit my parents, um, you know, we lived in a village of 900 people, but my parents were talking to us about social issues. You know, when I was young, I mean, it was, it must've been before I was 10 because we read it back when we were uh, in France. Before I was 10, my mom read Roots to me. Uh, and so even coming to the United States as a 10 year old white kid um, from France, I knew, I knew about slavery. I, I had a general understanding of what it entailed and how brutal it was um, in a way that I think even some of my 10 year old um, classmates uh, didn't. And so I think the combination of having that lived experience, but also having parents who were really sensitive uh, to these issues was really, really important. Yeah, my parents are just fantastic. If you could recommend one intervention for UVA students uh, in the beginning of their careers with the goal of improving awareness of and also mitigation of bias, what would that intervention be? <laughs> this is why I shouldn't be DDI. I hope Dean Solomon is still here. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you know, I... Okay, so yeah, so no, I do know. Um, we need more faculty of color, right, period. Um, we need more conversations, critical conversations um, about race uh, and the ways race intersect with other identities. Um, those need to not be one-off trainings, they need to not be one-off classes that are, um, you know, just electives. They need to be just really centrally located uh, in the work that we do. Um, you know, I think for Batten, my hope is also that we start really um, engaging more in that work. You know, our policy students are thoughtful, capable people, um, and we, we could be engaging in that work, I think, in really meaningful ways. Uh, and that's both through research uh, and service and engagement and partnerships. And so I, yeah, I think those things are where we're going. Um, and I think those are the things that we need to be doing. One big change with providers with COVID that will potentially stay around is extending telehealth. Any thoughts on if this could have impacts on pain disparities, equities, either positive or negative? Um, yeah, that's really complicated too, right? You guys are asking such good questions. Um, yeah. So, you know, that, uh, I imagine, I imagine that broadens access and that is, that is clearly a good thing. Um, we also know though, and I, you know, here I'm thinking of the work uh, by Jack DeVidio and now Igoara, um, showing that patient doctor interactions are really important. And that uh, when those interactions happen across lines of difference and particularly um, across uh, racial lines, those, those interactions are often not smooth. And what that does is it uh, makes patients all the more distrustful of, of healthcare providers. Um, I can imagine, and this is just me talking, right, without any kind of evidence, um, but I can imagine that when you, you know, put a greater interpersonal distance in those interactions that are already fraught, uh, that they could become more so. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there are very good reasons why a lot of patients of color don't trust healthcare um, professionals. We have an entire history in this country of abuses by the medical community. Um, and the Tuskegee experiment study is the sort of the, 
a glaring uh, and, and well-known example of that, but there are others. And so I, th I think we need to think really carefully uh, about how we restore that trust. Um, and we need to think carefully about whether and how um, these kinds of interactions either undermine further or can help uh, repair trust. Um, and but I don't know the answer to that. Okay, what are the new frontiers of research in this area where starting PhDs or even policymakers might invest their time? Uh, what academic fields do you think are furthest ahead of the game? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I mean, the work that I find most exciting, and I'm obviously biased in that respect, um, and so I'll only speak for what I, I think is the frontier that I'm looking to, uh, is work connecting historical and institutional racism to contemporary outcomes. Uh, and making those connections really clear, and there and making them concrete. Because I think even when you look at the COVID conversation, and a lot of people have talked about structural racism, if you think racism is something in the past, I think very little that um, makes that really concrete for people who might be skeptical to say like, oh yeah, like I totally see that now. Um, and so I think that work is actually, is, is really important. Uh, I would love my grad students to contribute to it, but I, I think people are doing that work. Um, and Dorothy Roberts has been doing that work for a long, long time and has been just so incredibly thoughtful about the ways in which race and the biologizing of race has been problematic in healthcare. And, and so I just, I always, you know, I look, I look to her work, I look to other works um, in sociology, in law, in public health. Um, but for me, the, the really exciting research is happening at the intersection of all those fields. You know, the, it's multiple, it's multi, multidisciplinary teams who I think are making progress in revealing the ways in which racism um, impacts, impacts health, impacts other outcomes. Um, and so I, for me, th this is why being at Baton is really exciting. You know, we have an inherently multidisciplinary space. Um, and so I, I trust that progress will be made. Um, academic research just takes a long time to, to get to a place where it can make change. So yeah, that's okay. Oh, I'm missing my chat. Oh, okay. I'm being told that I'm, I am getting over time. Uh, so I just thank you all so much uh, for joining me today. I really wish I could have seen your faces or at least heard your voices um, rather than just seeing myself and hear myself speak. Uh, but I hope that this was, um, I hope it was informative for you. I hope that it planted some seeds and some thoughts um, that will be generative for you. Um, you know, I, I think this notion that race is not true, uh, that it doesn't exist except that we've made it real through racism is really important and really, really um, powerful. And we need students, we need people, we need citizens who can really understand that and interrogate it. Um, and I want to see that for our students and I, I want to see that for all of us. Um, and so I hope that we will continue to have more of these conversations. I really, um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be a, a part of that. So thank you.